Good morning, South Park Church. Welcome to today's worship. I am Jenny McEwen, Director of Children's Ministry. Happy Fourth of July weekend, and thank you, Jesus, that we live in a country that celebrates freedom. Hopefully, everyone's had a wonderful weekend celebrating. Um, today is the first Sunday of the month, which is Communion Sunday, so grab your crackers, bread, uh, grape juice, coffee, tea, water, whatever you happen to have, anything will do. And a little bit later in the service, uh, we will be partaking in communion. Um, a reminder, our church website is southparkchurch.com forward slash online. Uh, this allows you to um, have access to, to many different uh, links within the church. A um, couple that I'll highlight um, you are able to click on the student and children's ministry link and it will take you um, right to our email so that you can reach out to us and we certainly look forward to hearing from you. There is also a give link on there. Um, so during, um, during this time, uh, this is something that helps our ministries continue to thrive and survive, not only during the pandemic, but of course, as we look forward to moving into um, our building. Your generosity certainly makes a difference and you're able to give through the website or mail in a check. So here um, uh, during service today, we do have two styles of worship incorporated. We will start with Dr. Katie Ann McCarty and our traditional worship team. And then Cole Bryant and the band will conclude our service with contemporary worship. So certainly looking forward to hearing from both of them. Um, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to worshiping with you and we look forward to seeing you back this Wednesday for our next Fireside Chat. Remember, they are only on Wednesdays now uh, for the rest of the summer. And then we will see you hopefully back here next Sunday for worship again. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.
Good morning, South Park Church. I'm Nikki Bedell. I'm one of the directors of student ministry here at South Park Church, and this morning I would love to lead us all in a prayer. So please, however you're comfortable, bow your head, raise your arms. Um, let's join in a time of prayer together. Dear Lord, today we think of our nation's independence, the ability that we have to worship you freely, openly, and without threat of persecution. We thank you for that freedom. May we use it to help lead others to the true freedom that comes from knowing Jesus. Today, we remember how blessed we are. We remember with gratitude all those who have sacrificed and given their lives for our freedom. We pray for our country that you would bring healing and renewal. May the changes we want to see begin with each of us. Today, we ask that you help us live our lives in a way that glorifies you. Give us the strength and the opportunity to be a blessing in someone's life. Thank you for our many, many abundant blessings. In your holy name we pray, amen. Hey, well, good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Lindsay Rich, and it is great to be with you this morning. Um, I do want to remind you that at the end of my teaching, we are going to be celebrating communion. So if you have not yet, go ahead and grab something small to eat and something to sip, um, to drink, so that at the end you can join us for celebrating communion. You know, this week, um, I have had some great text conversations. In fact, I think I have had my, my favorite text conversation that I've ever had, I think happened this week. Um, and that happened with my neighbor. So um, I have this neighbor who is my friend, and I've known her for almost a decade now. And, you know, we, we aren't the kind of friends that go out and like hang out with each other, but we're the kind of friends that, you know, we have keys to each other's houses and we give each other ingredients when we run out of stuff and we help each other with our kids. And, um, so I've known her for a long time and she, um, has not grown up in church at all. Like she, she wasn't taken to church when she was a kid and she doesn't go to church now. And, um, so she doesn't have any formal like teaching or understanding about Christianity. Um, although she and I have talked about stuff, you know, off and on through the years. But this week she texted me and she said, I have a question about religion, but my husband says that my question is rude and that I shouldn't ask you. <laughs> and she was like, if I try to word it in a way that's not offensive, can I ask you <laughs> or something like that? And I was, I, what I wanted to say was like, oh my gosh, yes. You know, like I love having conversations about theology and life and thinking through this stuff. And so I just, I wanted to respond to all of that, but I, you know, I decided I was going to play it cool. And so I said something like, sure. Um, and so she and I had this back and forth conversation going throughout the day and she would ask me a question and I would respond and she'd be like, let me think about that. And essentially what it came down to is my friend wanted to know what difference does Jesus make? You know, what, what is it that you think is significant about Jesus and, and like believing this or following him, you know, and, and underlying that and what she asked explicitly was like, is this all about the afterlife? right? Are you following Jesus so that after you die, you have, you think you'll have a better experience? Um, and so, you know, I just, I've been thinking about that and my conversation with her all week. And today, this morning, we are finishing a sermon series on parables. Uh, parables are short stories that have big meanings. And in the Bible, parables um, have 
those, those meanings are spiritual lessons for us. And so today we are going to be looking at the parable of the great banquet. This is a story that is told in Matthew and in Luke. And so what I hope is that as we are looking at this story today, that we also will be considering this question that my neighbor asked me and that I think is really valuable for all of us to think about in our own lives. Like, what difference does Jesus really make? What does it mean for me? Like, what what do I believe? And is this really a question about eternity? Um, so I want to start by reading this story, this parable together. And we're going to read from Luke, starting in chapter 14, verse 16. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So as we think about this story, I want to start by giving you a little bit of context where Jesus was when he told the story, and then hopefully try and understand what he was teaching to the people who first heard him tell the story, and then what we hopefully can learn and apply for our lives today. Um, So the context, Jesus was um, eating dinner when he told this story. He had been invited to a prominent religious leader's house for a meal. And while he was there, he looked around and he noticed that the people who were at the dinner were essentially jockeying for position at the table. So they were all concerned with their seating and they wanted a position of honor at the table. And so that prompted Jesus to tell the host, the man who had invited him to dinner, he he said to him, you know, when you host lunch or dinner, you should invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. Because if you just invite your friends and your family and other wealthy people, then you'll have invited them and then they'll invite you and, you know, they'll have paid you back and essentially you'll be swapping favors. But if you invite the poor, if you invite the marginalized, the people that society doesn't value, then you'll be blessed. Um, And there was a man who was seated at the table who heard Jesus say this. And his response to that was, well, everyone is blessed who will eat at the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. And so then Jesus told this story that we just read, the parable, in response to that man um, saying that to Jesus. So um, there are a number of things that we can learn from this story. But I think that one of the main things, one of the first things that you can notice when reading this is that Jesus was trying to orient the people to the fact that the kingdom of God was now. Um, So Jesus was sitting at a table and he was eating with these people and he said something that, you know, was very challenging to them, right? So essentially he said to the host, he was like, well, you know, looking around at the people, he was kind of like, you know, do you know what faithfulness in God's kingdom looks like? Not this right? Like something other than this. And so you can imagine that that created a moment of tension. Um, and Jesus was saying, you know, you ought to invite other people. Your your circle and who you invite to your table could look different, should look different than this. Um, and, and if you do that, then you'll be blessed. 
And so, so what happens when this man responds and he says, well, you know, everyone is blessed um, when, when they will, or everyone who will eat at this feast in the kingdom of heaven is blessed. Um, I think that that's the wording that he used. And so what he does is he shifts the focus to the future, right? The, the phrasing of this, it is a future um, statement where he's saying everyone who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of heaven is blessed. And so what he's referring to is this very common Jewish hope that, that people were anticipating in eternity that the, um, the faithful Jewish people would get to share a feast with the Messiah, that there was going to be this big celebratory meal in heaven with the Messiah and the faithful Jewish people. And if you are someone who has read the Bible for a little while, that may sound familiar because we also talk about that. Um, the, the book of Revelation, John, who wrote that book, talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? We talk about this meal in eternity with heaven, right, where we'll all be feasting and celebrating. And so there is this imagery of this thing that will happen. And so when Jesus is sitting at this table and he's talking about the reality of what like the, the makeup of the people who are sitting around the table. And this guy responds and says, well, actually blessing and faithfulness and stuff can look this way in the future, right? He is shifting the emphasis of the kingdom of God and what salvation looks like to be a time in the future. And so Jesus responds by telling him this story and bringing it back to now. Jesus is reminding the people who are listening and his host that the kingdom of God is now. That is the central message that Jesus brought when, when, um, when he came to earth, right? That the long-awaited kingdom had arrived. That was the message of Jesus. When you think about the gospel and you think about the story and how it happened, sometimes it's helpful to think in terms of two kingdoms. And so, when Jesus came to earth, the kingdom of darkness was prevalent. And so Jesus came and he took the form of a person. And when he did that, he brought and ushered in the kingdom of God. And then through Jesus's life, through his ministry, through his teaching, through his miracles, all of the stuff that Jesus did, he was literally and figuratively pushing back against the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. And so when you read the stories and the things that Jesus said, right, he would say things like when he would cast out a demon, he would say, you know, when I do this, the, the kingdom of God has come to you. And, and he was reminding them the kingdom of God is here and it is now. That is the message of the kingdom. And so when Jesus was seated with them and he was telling them this story, he was reminding the people um, who were listening. And as we hear it now, we remember that the kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is in the future, but it is it has been brought to earth now. And, and there is a reality to living in that kingdom that has implications for how we interact in the world. And so it has implications on who is in our social circle and what um, the makeup of the invitation list to our dinner party looks like and in how we understand honor and where we're seated in, in terms of, of honoring people, right? The kingdom of God has something to say about these things because the kingdom of God is not only a far off, more abstract, distant place. The kingdom of God is here now. Um, you know, there's a lot that's going on in the world right now. I was reading a couple of articles that said that this is the biggest civil rights movement or moment in the history of our country. There is a lot that's being highlighted right now in terms of racial injustice and a lot of unlearning and relearning that is being done in terms of the history of our country and our nation. And, um, so, you know, people are talking about schooling and they're talking about the wealth gap and they're talking about where people live and they're talking about policing and all of this, the, the stuff and the realities of what life and what justice and um, what equality looks like in, in our society. And right now there are a lot of church leaders 
who are saying a lot about this, who are calling on the followers of Jesus to stand up and to to learn about this and to participate in um, the, the standing up for justice and for righteousness. The United Methodist Church actually has been super vocal. I don't know if you follow along with our district superintendent and with our bishops and the United Methodist Church generally, but in their emails and their social media posts, um, the podcast they're putting out, there is a lot of, of strong stuff that's coming out in terms of the, the need for the people of God to, to stand in this moment um, and to stand for justice and for the attributes of the kingdom of God. And it's the, the, the statements of the church broadly are causing um, some discomfort. And, you know, I got a, a text this week. My text messages are on fire this week, y'all. And uh, this text that I got was not just to me, it was to a group of people. And this was written by um, a woman who has been a part of her church for a long time. She's not a Methodist, but um, she was saying in her text, you know, that she's really upset with all of the stuff that's going on in the world right now. And she was encouraging people um, to look at Jesus. And, and I think she was just trying to do something good. I think she was trying to draw people together. And she said, you know, we just, we need to look at Jesus and we need to remember who he is and what he's done and uh, the fact that through his death and resurrection that he's provided salvation for us. And we just need to focus in on the gospel and we need to stop talking about racism and we need to stop talking about anti-racism. And, you know, all that like focus and attention is just distracting us from the true gospel message, which is salvation and eternity with Jesus. And, you know, I read that and I thought oh, like you, people are confused about this. And, and I, I just kept thinking about that as I was reading and preparing for today and reading about this parable that we chose long before this week um, to, to teach on and recognizing that this is exactly what Jesus is addressing. You know, this, this understanding that the kingdom of God is not only providing salvation for eternity in a far off distant time and place, but that the kingdom of God is here and it is now. And the realities of the kingdom necessitate that we as people of the kingdom um, live out the values of the kingdom in the world as right now. And so this story that Jesus is telling really stirs up confidence in us when we might be hesitant to, to speak out or when we might be unsure if we ought to um, be involved in conversations about this, right? It, it doesn't dilute the message of salvation or the message of the kingdom. This is the kingdom coming to bear in the world around us. So we, when Jesus came and, and provided a way for us to be a part of his kingdom, we now get to be a part of that kingdom now. So we get to join Jesus in the work that he started in pushing back against the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. And we get to do that right now in the world around us. And so that's actually rather exciting for an invitation for us as the people of God to say we get to stand with the kingdom um, and to insist and to pray and to long for the, the kingdom of God to be on earth as it is in heaven, just like Jesus taught us. So th this story that Jesus taught um, reminded the people and reminds us that the kingdom of God is not just far off. It is not just eternity, but it is now. And another thing that this story teaches us is that the kingdom of God um, takes precedent over everything else. So one of the things that's surprising about this story that would have been surprising to them when they first heard it and is surprising to us now is who doesn't actually make it to the banquet? Like who, who doesn't actually show up and get to participate? And so there were a number of people, well, not enough, all of the people who were initially invited, making excuses for why they couldn't actually come and why they wouldn't show up. And the way that invitations work then, it's sort of similar to how they work now, where you um, get a first invite that is kind of like an RSVP. 
So, well, like it's our RSVP. So they would indicate whether or not they intended to come. And then on the day of the event, if they said they were going to come, then they would send for them and say, okay, it's time to come. So these were people who had expressed interest and said, yeah, that's something that I want to participate in. Yeah, that's something that I want to go to. Yes, this is somewhere that I'll show up. But then on the day of it, they had all of these reasons and excuses why they actually weren't going to come. And the things that Luke lists are um, one of them had just bought a field. Another had just bought these oxen. Another had just gotten married and so wanted to spend time with his wife. And, you know, the the thing that's kind of crazy about this is that these reasons that are given are rather shocking, actually. Because these are things that we would really say that we value. And the the parable isn't saying whether to value them or not value them, right? Um, but, But when you look at it, these are things that are demonstrating hard work and, you know, some economic wisdom and someone who's prioritizing their spouse and, and, you know, valuing time with their family, you know, so... Protestant work ethic and family values, you know, these are things that we normally would value. And so it is, it's shocking, right? This story, parables are shocking. This is a shocking thing that the things that we value are the things that are used as excuses for people to not participate in the kingdom. Things that we would say are good and would maybe characterize people who are in the kingdom. Jesus is actually saying, hey, These are things that not, he isn't saying these are bad things. He's saying these are things that made people unavailable. These are things that people were focused on that made them unable, unwilling, unavailable to show up. And so, you know, whether it was just they were busy or they were distracted or they were valuing something else, these were things that kept them from participating in uh, this banquet. Mark Buchanan um, said that busyness actually makes us stop caring about things that we care about. And I think that is an important thing to consider when we think about the stuff that we often, you know, will fill our lives with and the things that it can keep us from doing, right? And so I was I was listening or rereading these and thinking, you know, these people who had these really good reasons and were really polite about it, right? Oh, will you please excuse me? Please excuse me, right? And how often do we do things or say things like that? Oh, you know, I'd love to come, but oh, I just, I have this work thing. Uh, or like, oh, we just, we have this soccer game. Thanks so much for the invitation, but you know, I have work being done in my house. Thanks so much, but you know, it's book club night. My grandson has the recital um, for his piano. Oh, thanks so much. I just, I just can't. And when I think, you know, I was reading this and thinking about the ways that this can show up in our lives. And for us, you know, I thought that it's, it's actually rather telling and significant to think that so often we want to make excuses for the stuff that like for why we aren't living out kingdom values right now too. And, and for explaining why we really value something, but we just can't do it, but we just not yet. Right. You know, I'd really, I'd love to live in that neighborhood, but just the schools, you know, I'd really love to have relationships and friendships with people that don't look like me. I'm just, I'm so busy. I've just got all of these things. You know, I'd love to do that thing. I'd love to participate. I'd love, you know, all of this stuff. We've RSVP'd, yes, we've declared that we care about this stuff. But then when it comes right down to it, we end up being unavailable for the things that God has invited us to do. And this is where a small story packs a big punch. Because these are often good things. And these are things Um, that we would say look holy and right and righteous and good. And this is where I always want to remind people that these are Jesus's words, not my words. But he says, I tell you that not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. 
that all of the people um, who made excuses, who focused on other things, actually don't get to participate in the kingdom, that, that they're not participating in the kingdom, right? It's like this, the reality is that the kingdom is here and it's among us and we're invited, but we can't divide the reality of the present kingdom and the future kingdom. And that's what they were wanting to do. And that's sometimes what we want to do, where we appreciate who Jesus is and what he's done. And we declare that we believe it. And, you know, we care about this stuff. But actually, we think of it in terms of heaven. And we think of it in terms of forever and eternity and this distant, far off place. And when it comes down to actually living out the values of the kingdom and how Jesus says, this is going to impact what your dinner parties look like. This is going to impact what your social circles look like. This is going to impact what your schedule looks like and maybe time with your spouse and your economics and and all of these things. And we're like, can you just please excuse me for this part? But I'm rather interested in that part. And Jesus is saying that faithfulness in his kingdom looks like living out the realities of his kingdom right now. And so this is the invitation to us in this story, right? This reminder that the kingdom of God is now, that the kingdom of God takes precedent over everything else. And one of the other things that this story teaches us, and this is probably my favorite thing about this story, is that the kingdom of God turns out to be wildly welcoming. So what happens when these people are invited and they decide that they don't want to participate is that the king, uh, or well, it's not a king in this, in this version. He's a king in Matthew. Um, in Luke, it's a man, a man throwing a banquet. And he decides that the party's going to go on. And so he's going, he's going to um, open up the guest list and, and he sends his servants out to bring in anybody they could find, right? He starts with the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, and then they just throw the gates wide open. Um, in Matthew, when they're telling this story, it's not a man, it's a king. And this is the part um, that's that's so cool because he says, um, oh, let me, let me read it directly to you because I love, I love it. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like this extravagant um, celebration. So I don't know if you have ever been to like a really, really fancy wedding. I have been to one and I, um, I, I don't actually know exactly how I got to go to this wedding because I don't know the bride or the groom, but, um, my stepmom is like friends with the mother of the bride. And so somehow that turned into an invitation for me and I got to go to this really extravagant wedding. And it was the kind of wedding where um, at the dinner, everyone was served lobster tail and steak and chicken. And um, at the table, they had these like candelabras that were so beautiful. And I mentioned something to the mother of the bride about these candelabras. And she said, oh, yeah, you know, we went to California and found those and we rented them and had them shipped out for the wedding. And she explained to me that despite their endless searching, there was just nothing suitable anywhere on the East Coast, right? They just couldn't find it. So they had to go to California. And just like everything about this wedding was like that. And this family, like, yes, they are wealthy, but they're not royal. And Matthew, when he's describing this, the kingdom of God is like a wedding banquet for the son of a king. Not one of the sons, but the son of a king. That means this is the heir, okay? And so this is possibly the biggest celebration in the history of this family, right? In their lifetime that they'll experience together is this wedding celebration, this feast for which they killed the fattened calves, right? So you can get a sense of the elaborate nature and the the goodness of what's going on here. And do you know who gets invited? Do you know who actually gets to sit at the tables and eat that extravagant food and participate in the extravagance of this wedding? Random people off the street. Just whoever happened to be walking by, right? That's who gets to come. 
And so, I mean, I love it. Matthew and Luke both say literally anyone they could find, that's who they got to come in. And I just love that because so often we struggle with belonging. So many of us wrestle with, you know, this um, idea of like, do I fit? Do I belong? Am, Am I wanted? Am I needed? Is this a place where I belong? And we struggle with that in sometimes in our families and in our friend groups and at our workplaces. And we struggle with that with God and in the church as well. And so this story just flips that all on its head and it insists that everyone belongs because it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done, you get an invitation, right? It's anybody they could find was brought in. Hey, come on in to the extravagance. Come on in to this place that's better than you could even imagine. And so it's Matthew says it's the good and the bad, right? So it doesn't matter what you've done or what's been done to you. Nothing could prevent you from getting scooped in, right? And, and it doesn't matter how much good you've done. You're not buying a ticket in. You can't earn your way in, right? Your ability to sit at the table and participate in this extravagance is based entirely on the goodness and the generosity of the king who said, come on in. Everybody's in. Everybody's welcome. Everybody belongs. This is amazing, right? This is a story that captures the heart of the gospel. Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. It's a place where everybody is invited and not everybody is going to respond. Some people are going to make excuses and some people aren't going, um, aren't going to respond. But this is a place where everyone is welcome, where everyone is invited. And this is a kingdom that is not only far off and abstract, but this is a kingdom that's here and now. And the goodness of God is available to us here and now. And we get to live out the realities of this kingdom here and now. And and that will shift things and that will change things. And it will change our social circles and it will change our dinner parties and it will change our understanding of honor and it will it will change a lot of things if we let it. And that is a good thing because that is the characteristic of the kingdom of God. So if there is one thing that I want you to remember and to take away from today, it's this, the kingdom of God is here now and you are invited to participate, right? You are welcomed in to the kingdom that is here and now. And so as we um, remember that, I want to invite you to celebrate communion with me. I I can't think of a more fitting uh, way to end this sermon than for us to remember together who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And really, every time we celebrate communion together, that's what we're doing. Um, So if if you are new to this and you haven't done it before, um, this is something that everyone is invited to participate in. You don't have to be uh, a member of our church. You don't have to even have decided to follow Jesus yet. Anyone who wants to respond to Jesus in any way, I want to invite you to um, join me now as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And this is remembering um, who Jesus is and what he did for us in his death on the cross. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered around with his disciples and um, he, he shared a meal with them. And in essence, at this time, um, he, he took bread and he took wine and he told them that he wanted them to carry on doing this in the taking of, of bread and wine to remember his death and his resurrection. And so that is what we do. And that's what we're going to do today. So whatever you have um, is fine. It can be a piece of bread and juice, which is more traditional. Uh, it could be part of a Pop-Tart or you know just whatever and a sip of water. It isn't the specific items that are significant. It's the act and, and doing, um, remembering who Jesus is and what he has um, done for us. And so we are just asking the Lord to meet us 
in this act of remembering him. Um, So on the night that um, Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples around a table and he took bread and he, he broke the bread and he told his disciples, this is my body that is broken for you. So do this in remembrance of me. And so I want to invite you to take your bread and to eat it and to remember the body of our broken Lord. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is for you. So whenever you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. So whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So friends, um, will you pray with me as we proclaim the Lord's death? Lord, we thank you for coming to earth and ushering in your kingdom. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you for your broken body and your shed blood and you um, offering yourself so that we have forgiveness and redemption and a way to join you in your kingdom. And Lord, we thank you that that kingdom is an invitation into life forever with you. And that invitation is into a kingdom that has realities right now. And so, Lord, we ask that as we follow you, that you would teach us once again how high and wide and deep and long your love for us is. And God, we ask that in that, um, that we would experience more of you and more of your goodness and more of what it is to follow you. And we ask in doing that, that you would teach us more about the life and the fullness that you came to bring, that we could really experience life to the full um, here, now, and in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to join with me now to sing along with Cole Bryant, who is the leader of our modern worship. Uh, He and the worship band are going to lead us in singing about God, who is our living hope. So we just celebrated that in communion. And now will you join us in singing to the Lord, who is our living hope? Trust you, Jesus. I'm with the chasm, and then lay between us. I'll hide the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could him?
Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Come on, this is good. Then came the morning, here we go, that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to break out of the silence. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will see you guys next week at southpark.online.church. Be blessed. Have a good one.